So hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for logging into this webinar today. Uh, I understand uh, it's a it's a weekday, and I'm sure a lot of you are you know log you know logged into this webinar from your office uh, itself. And uh, and uh, so thank you so much for being so patient uh, and waiting for uh, for the for, for the first five minutes. There is some uh, bit of a technical glitch. One of our speakers is facing. Vinay is facing some technical glitch. Uh, allow Vinay a couple of minutes uh, to join in. Meantime, uh, what we would do is we would uh, quickly uh, have a round of introduction, um, and uh, maybe we'll give you a little bit of a background about the, about the organization. We'll try and uh, use this time by the time Vinay uh, addresses his IT issues. I'm sure. Uh, uh, well, I, every time uh, in a the big start of every webinar, I uh, talk about this site uh, slide, uh, stating that most of you would already be aware of us, uh, but still uh, uh, doing the customary introduction. Lobbit is a uh, is providing SaaS based risk and compliance management solutions for enterprises with uh, integrated regulatory intelligence uh, and regulatory change management across the globe. Uh, today we are uh, we have served around 70 plus entities, uh, 70 plus countries, uh, you know, 225 plus uh, businesses are uh, using our software. We have covered 1,200 plus locations, uh, uh, and there are you know team of around 60 plus lawyers and government secretaries who are uh, part of our team uh, who are uh, working with our clients and uh, helping them being more compliant. I'm sure since if you are using our products and services, you're getting our regulatory updates, each of any of them. I'm sure uh, you would agree with us that we have we've been able to retain 100% of our clients over the last so many years, which is a very uh, remarkable achievement in this in, uh, market in this industry, which is wherein um, you are you are pushing a product which people don't want to use, uh, uh, which is a regulatory compliance management solution. And I'm sure if you have seen this slide the last uh, time, and if you're seeing the slide today, you would have seen some numbers changing the slide as well. Let me uh, quickly introduce uh, to our speakers for the day. Uh, Neera Chanduk. Uh, Neera is, uh, is someone I know her for more than five years now, and we've been, uh, you know, she, she's been using our products in, our, of uh, in, in the past company as well. I know Neera. Uh, uh, as uh, as someone who is who pushes the limit not just for her own team but for us as well um, and uh, she's somebody who is very very focused on uh, getting things right uh, in the right in the right manner she's a uh, she's a company secretary and a law graduate uh, with uh, a, with a pg diploma in cybersecurity laws from in the law institute uh, she's a seasoned uh, legal professional with around 16 plus years experiences having worked and served with you know uh, uh, globally um, across around 100 plus uh, uh, jurisdiction 100 plus countries she has uh, uh, you know uh, been part of understanding the data protection uh, and data privacy laws for her current organization she has been involved in the cross border water board acquisitions mna fpi general uh, corporate uh, laws ipr management risk management ethics and compliances um, and um, in her current role also in the company which uh, you know dbo tech which uh, where she is leading uh, uh, the legal and company secretary function uh, for the organization globally she is uh, uh, dealing with clients in 100 plus uh, countries uh, of the company vinay gupta vinay is uh, vinay is facing a little uh, uh, you know a technical issue in joining uh, which our team is right quickly work, you know working with him uh, to resolve Vinay is a seasoned professional. I'm sure if uh, you're on the speed, you would uh, possibly know Vinay. Vinay is a seasoned professional with around 20 plus years of experience in the legal and compliance field. Uh, he has served as a financial uh, uh, chief financial officer, CFO in, his, in the Aswell subsidiary of ICRA and has been instrumental in growing the uh, program management vertical of the company. He holds a directorship of an um, ICRA and subsidiary, which is unit and sub, uh, providing uh, uh, and is providing the strategic support and uh, decision making with focus on value driver drivers and risk for uh, risk mitigation and enhancing the value of business. Uh, Vinay is uh, a thorough professional, uh, and uh, my experience of working with Vinay has been great. He has been somebody who has always been pushing us, uh, uh, giving us very uh, constructive feedbacks in terms of how we can improvise on the services and the products. 
and uh, whenever he speaks, he speaks out of passion, and that's what has. Uh, yeah, I'm sure Vinay is going to be bringing out bringing out in the discussion today as well. Digital data, uh, uh, you know, DPDP Act, uh, Digital Personal Data Protection Act, is something which we have all been um, uh, talking about, hearing about, uh, discussing, uh, uh, and being curious about as well. Uh, in today's discussion, in the today's webinar. Uh, our agenda will focus on giving you a little bit of a background about you know how the law has come up, how it's been framed, you know so far, how the journey has been, some of the gui guiding principles which everyone has to uh, you know uh, be aware of, whether you are in IT, whether you are in HR, uh, taxation, financial, secretary function, legal functions. Uh, we would also be talking about uh, some of the you know, giving your perspective about the global laws uh, and a bit of an overview about uh, how uh, other countries have framed their laws and what kind of the laws they have framed. Um, some of the important factors, actors, in, you know, uh, which plays a significant role because this in this law, uh, you have to understand which are the key actors uh, here. Talking about this, uh, you know, uh, classification of data, uh, and here we would also talk about how it, you know, uh, it correlates with the global uh, uh, laws. And uh, obligation of data fiduciary in terms of you know that uh, uh, consent, and uh, we would also be uh, taking care. You know, talking about the you know due to this responsibility and how, as an organization, you will have to start preparing yourself as uh, you, know, at, at, you know the law becomes uh, operation uh, comes into force. So let's have a quick recap of how this be, uh, bill became an act. So this conversation uh, of the data privacy began in the year 2017 with the Justice Putu Swami's judgment in the Supreme Court and this historic ruling identified privacy as a fundamental right for the digital nagriks of India and where the ministry prompted to constitute the committee of experts, which was chaired by Justice B. N. Krishna in the year uh, 2017 right in in a span of one year uh, the the committee presented a 176 page report which was immediately sent for the next iteration of the bill and in 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 a span of one and a half year which was in the year december 2019 bill was tabled for the parliament to review uh, due to a delay caused by the pandemic the joint parliamentary committee uh, chaired by P.P. Chaudhary submitted its report after two years, which was in the year 2021 December. Uh, so uh, right after like year and a half again, ministry withdrew the bill uh, and, and with Ashwini uh, Vishnu's approval stating that comprehensive legal framework is required to be presented soon. So last year in December, uh, in, in November 2022, the bill was released for the public consultation and wherein we at Lorbit also presented the industry uh, opinions, industry experts reviews and presented to the ministry. So uh, this year in July, the cabinet approved the bill to be tabled in the monsoon parliament session and few days back as we got to know that the bill was passed and got the president assent on 11th August 2023. So that's how the bill uh, bill was effected and uh, you know uh, it is yet to be implemented and uh, the rules are yet to be notified. So let's wait till it comes into effect. So in fact uh, uh, on this uh, part I will also want to um, you know highlight this that uh, while uh, on this particular bill, our uh, teams have been uh, tracking the changes from the day one. Uh, I'm sure uh, if you are following us, if you're using our uh, services, or if you are even uh, uh, you know a subscriber of uh, our uh, newsletters, you would see that we've been writing articles on this subject from from the very, from the very beginning. We are also taking expert opinions. Uh, we uh, when the when the bill was tabled. Uh, for public opinion, we took, we spoke to people uh, from every industry. Uh, I think we would have spoken to uh, the head of legal and the data production officer from at least 20, you know, 20 plus com uh, company, took their opinions and also presented uh, uh, our report uh, to the uh, to the government and uh, gave us uh, gave our uh, uh, suggestions. And we were happy to also uh, uh, notice that some of the suggestions which uh, were uh, part of our uh, you know report were also considered while 
um, the the main act the, the key uh, the, the act was tabled in the in the parliament so there are seven principles as we all know that every law when it is formed or it is uh, in the process of uh, uh, getting uh, affected there are some principles behind it so uh, as well likewise digital personal data protection is also based on the seven principles of the data economy so the first one here is the rightful usage so uh, it says that the data which is collected should be used in a lawful fair and the transparent manner uh, to the individuals concerned Second is resolute dissemination, which means that personal data must only be used for the purposes as it is collected for. Uh, third is the relevant data collection, which focuses on the concept of data minimization, which means the bare minimum or the necessary data should only be collected, which will fulfill the purpose. Uh, fourth is the data reliability. So data collected should be accurate. There should be no duplication or it should not be breached or amended at any form. Fifth is the period of data uh, retention, which means that the personal data which is collected cannot be stored perpetually by default and storage should be fixed to a limited uh, for a, for a uh, limited to a fixed duration. Uh, sixth, as you can see, authorized collection and processing, which means that there has to be a reasonable safeguards to ensure that no unauthorized collection or processing of personal data can be done. And the last one here says that the accountability of users where the person who uh, who collects the data would decide the purpose and means of processing the personal data should be accountable for processing the data which has been collected. The security of personal data is now crucial in the digital era. Around the world, nations and organizations are passing laws to control the handling of personal data. So the question here is, do we have enough resources in India who are aware of the data protection laws or we are still struggling with who would understand the subject better? Nevertheless, if we talk about setting up the tone, then the GDPR General Data Protection Regulation is one of the foremost laws respecting the privacy of individuals in a globalized world. It is but natural that the Indian DPDP Digital Personal Data Protection Act resonate closely with the exhibit certain similarities with the GDPR. If your company handles personal data, it's important to understand and comply with the principles of the GDPR as well. So few principles are lawfulness, fairness, transparency, confidential, confidentialities and accountabilities and so on. Wherein Indian firms that process the personal data of individuals within the European Union must follow the GDPR along with the data protection rules of that specific country. So here on the slide, we can see the list of 30 plus countries that have their own data protection laws available and set very strong beliefs on the protection of data like Denmark, Romania, Netherlands, UK, Austria. So these are 30 plus countries which have their own data protection laws. So now we have finally come up with the India's long awaited data protection law as Digital Personal Data Protection Act taking it step closer to being implemented. Despite the numerous similarities between DPDP and GDPR, the DPDP is unique in its own way. However, the European Union and India have different approaches and legal system as seen by the variances in the breadth, legal foundations and the sanctions. Lastly, I would like to conclude with GDPR has already set a high standard and we are late to have such securities protections within time. But nevertheless, we are all set to have Digital Personal Data Protection Act. Next slide, so, please. So the, so the point which we are trying to drive here is, you know, uh, this is a common question which I have uh, heard in many conversations. How as an, are we India as an, a country jumping this, uh, 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 you know, in the gun and bringing a data protection uh, act, you know, which becomes very stringent. Uh, my answer is uh, no. Uh, there are, you know, uh, almost 440 odd countries globally which have already have their own data, you know, data production um, regulations. Now, you, you may say that these are most of them are Europeans. They already have a GDPR, uh, but 
we, along with the GDPR, they have their own specific regulations in their respective countries. And I'm sure there is an article on our website uh, which you can read and uh, you know get to know more about this. Secondly, uh, in terms of understanding the data protection, uh, putting the regulations in place, I think uh, because the GDP, because of the GDPR and other countries, except uh, you know implementing the, their respective uh, uh, data protection regulations, enough work has already been done in this line. Enough expertise have been created. Uh, there are uh, uh, there are people available who understand uh, what kind of a, uh, policies to create, what kind of procedure to uh, you know to put, and how to start managing the uh, uh, you know or how to start getting compliant with the uh, data protection regulations of different countries and one last thing i want to also mention if you if you are someone who is dealing with more than one country you just don't have to uh, look at the data protection regulation in 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 your, in a country of origin for example in case in this case it'll be india but you also have to look at the data protection regulation in those countries and uh, maybe in a different forum we can talk you know more about how uh, globally people have uh, a different organization or global organization they are taking care of uh, their good data protection you know uh, uh, compliance with the specific data protection regulations in each country you know, each of the country now uh, uh, Vinay, I, I believe you have joined now uh, i uh, nira uh, i can see you Vinay and nira now i'm, I'm handing it over to you uh, from here uh, Thanks, Jen. Thanks for the introduction, and it's a pleasure to be part of this webinar. Mm, okay. To understand the scope of this whole act, it's good to divide it, the divide the scope in two parts. First one is the collection of personal processing of digital personal data within the territory of India. Second, outside the territory of India. If it's within the territory of India, any collection of data in digital form. That's get covered under the scope of this act. If it is not in digitized form, but subsequently digitized, then it will be this act will become applicable. In case of processing of data outside India, if such processing is in connection with any offering of goods and services to data principles within the territory of India, then again the scope this will be the this will come in the ambit of this new legislation. Where it is not applicable, it's personal data processed by an individual for personal and domestic purpose. Personal and domestic purpose, maybe uh, you are collecting the information of your domestic help, an individual collecting an information for domestic purpose, maybe a uh, phone number of electrician, plumber, Aadhaar card of domestic health. All this will not be part of this legislation. Individual is not required to comply with this whole. Uh, uh, compliance is provided under this legislation. And any personal information that is made available by the data principle itself to the public, in that case, again, this will not be applicable. If it is by the data principle by the third party in order to ensure or fulfill an obligation under any law for the time being in force, then again, this will not come under the scope of this legislation. So this is how we can you know, understand the scope. If you have some questions or queries on this particular thing, then I am happy to take right now. Or if you want, we can take it at a later stage. So, Nira, uh, you know, uh, on this particular point, uh, since there are many people who are uh, non from non legal background, uh, you know, who are from IT background and all. Now, uh, if you could further dwell, one of the very interesting question came from somebody in the manufacturing industry: Is it applicable for us? Now, if you could help us understand, you know, a little bit, a couple of examples, maybe. Will it be what kind of industries have you know? Will it be applicable, and how in in those particular industries this could be applicable on them? So I will say that irrespective of the industry, it will be applicable to all the corporates because each and every corporate is dealing with the personal information. They are collecting the information of the employees, if not uh, the information of our customers or clients, but the employees' personal information they are collecting. So maybe they are exempt from certain clauses, but as far as compliance regime is concerned under the act, that will be applicable on them. OK, so, yeah. so, so what, what I understand it, uh, uh, there's another question is that corporate or any organization. Uh, what I understand is you're saying as if you're doing business in, in India, you are a uh, incorporated entity. You have to be mindful of uh, this legislation because somewhere you are collecting 
personal information, even if it's not a customer, but maybe it could be your employee. Am I am I getting it correct? Yes, Jayant, and because currently the you know definition of personal data itself is very very broad. Everything or everything is covered there: name, phone number, address, email ID. So in some form or the other, organizations are collecting this information. So obviously, uh, currently, if you see the scope, then it will get applicable. Maybe some exemption. Obviously, there are exemptions from complying with certain provisions of the law. But overall, as far as the scope is concerned, they are in the scope of this particular legislation. Okay. Yeah, so uh, first of all, thank you, Jayant and team, and good, uh, good afternoon to everyone. So after a long wait and multiple drafts, the Digital Personal Data Protection Act 223 has been passed by both the Houses of Parliament, giving India its first legislation regarding citizens' online privacy. Uh, the Act is applicable on the processing of digital personal data as we have you know, spoken till date within India, where such data is collected online or if the data has been handed over in a hard form and subsequently digitized then the act gets covered there as well so it will also apply to you know the processing outside india if it is offering goods or services within india one of the uh, you know key factors that we would like to you know talk about and bring about here is that you know what are the key Many we lost you. Many we lost you. I'm audible now. Yes, you are. Okay. So I don't know where we uh, left. So I was talking about you know the actors and the significant roles. So Act has uh, you know clearly outlined uh, what are the key uh, you know actors which we have tried to you know put out in this slide. So first and the foremost is the data principle. So data principle is anybody who is sharing the data, be it uh, you know of uh, you know let's say a mobile number or an email ID or anything of that sort. So it also covers not just the individual; it has also prescribed you know the category of children. So that is something which is very uh, you know uh, important for all of us to understand, especially the significant data fiduciaries. <clears throat> who deal into the data of, let's say, you know, not just the uh, adults above the age of 18, and also the children. So those data principle which pertain to children has to be obtained from a consent, has to be obtained from a lawful guardian only. So that, that is something that, you know, one has to keep in mind. And I, I think, you know, the social media platforms and other, you know, uh, huge data fiduciaries, they have to really look into, you know, their compliance uh, posture and see how this has to be, you know, complied going forward. The other important, uh, you know, the uh, actor I would say is, you know, significant data fiduciary. So which is could be notified by the uh, central government and there are certain parameters which have been mentioned for that. So depending upon the volume sensitivity of the, uh, you know, the uh, data that is being managed risks to the right of the data principle, potential impact on the sovereignty and integrity of I India. Mean, there are host of, a whole host of parameters which have been defined in the act. So depending upon that, uh, Uh, when we, we, we lost you in between, I think there was some internet lag at your end. Uh, we oh, lost you in between. Yeah. Is it is it is it okay now? It's okay now. Okay. Now. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So I was saying, uh, uh, significant data fiduciary can be notified by the central government. So this is the concept. Wherein you know two kinds of data fiduciaries are there in the act. One is the simple data fiduciary, which could be any organization, which could be an organization like uh, you know. Uh, who is not into dealing into the uh, uh, personal data, but yes, uh, collecting the data of employees or let's say they have the you know vendors or the softwares who are processing, uh, let's say the HR or the payroll uh, uh, for their employees. So those can be data processors which are there. So those are one category. Second is the SDF. And for SDF, it is very important that, you know, because a lot of emphasis and a lot of uh, uh, onus has been, uh, you know, cast upon the SDFs uh, to sort of, you know, ensure that you know there are proper controls and measures which are there in the uh, organization so that there should not be any data leakage 
then there is data uh, processor. So data processor could be, so for example, Jan, you, you asked a question uh, uh, to me that whether you know a manufacturing company, uh, whether the DAC could be applicable on them or not. So yes, it is applicable. It is going to be applicable because even if you are not processing the data of your, uh, you know, let's say employees or otherwise not dealing into personal data too, man, too much, but at least, you know, you, the organization would be, you know, sort of having a tie up with the software companies like an HR payroll outsider or a, or a background verification check as simple as that. And these days, every organization does that background verification. So for them, you know, to, it has to be ensured that the data processors whom they engage with, whether they have certain protocols, they have certain measures adopted there or not. And therefore, you know, the contracts with those data processor has to be reevaluated, has to be revisited in the light of the new act. Then there is a, a data protection board. So now, uh, although this act has, you know, recently been uh, passed by the uh, both houses of the parliament, etc. Uh, government is in the process of appointing, uh, you know, a data protection board. Obviously, it would require it require a chairman. There will be members to the uh, board who will have the uh, powers of the civil court. And uh, the only appeal that can be filed against the data protection board will go to the appellate tribunal, which is under the telephone uh, uh, telecom regulatory authority of India, and thereafter Supreme Court. So, data protection board is going to be a very very sort of a nodal agency for managing and for monitoring and ensuring that the compliance to this act is being properly adhered to. Uh, just like, you know, I would say, I would, you know, rather, you know, uh, uh, place it like SEBI, you know, which regulates the financial sector market, I think for the data industry, data uh, protection principles to be, you know, monitor would be done by the data protection board. Uh, data protection officer, yes, uh, I think, uh, you know, act, clearly mentioned that uh, the SDFs, significant data fiduciaries, they have to appoint a data protection officer. There is no, uh, you know, exemption to that, uh, to that extent. But for the data fiduciaries who do not process data on day in, day out, they do not, who do not have, you know, a lot of personal information, et cetera. For them also, it is kind of, you know, beneficial or other, you know, they have to name somebody uh, as a DPO, just in case, you know, the, the, the data principal wants to reach out to them giving the consent, withdrawing the consent, you know, and so on. And finally, the consent manager. So this is separately uh, uh, a parallel kind of an agency where consent manager, uh, uh, you know, can act as an intermediary between the data principal and the data fiduciary, wherein the consent can be, you know, managed, reviewed. Uh, if the data principal would like to withdraw the consent, then the consent manager would act as an intermediary to ensure that, you know, the data is erased uh, in, a, in a timely manner, in a reasonable uh, period of time. So these are the key, uh, uh, you know, I would say definitions also and the actors also who are going to implement uh, or shall be, you know, play a key role in the entire scheme of things. So, so Vinay, uh, you know, uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the beginning itself, there are a lot of uh, people who are, uh, you know, not from a law background uh, who are attending this session today. Um, so one of the common question coming is, uh, uh, can we can we give more examples? Maybe try to make it uh, uh, more relatable uh, if somebody does has not possibly read this law. So specific questions, uh, if I if I may ask you, uh, you mentioned about data fiduciary and significant data fiduciary. Can you give me a you know a couple of examples? You know what kind of a company or what, what industry could possibly fall into data fiduciary and significant data fiduciary? How do you classify? Uh, you know, the uh, I'll talk about significant data fiduciary first. Uh, you know, the organizations, I would say, like social media platforms who have, you know, their, uh, uh, you know, presence in the country, outside country. There are global organizations who, you know, if you download a particular app, a lot of permissions they ask for, you know, and, you know, we, we have been accepting it. You know, I accept just because you have to download that information. So for them, it is very, very important. And, you know, there are uh, apps, perhaps applications where they, you know, also track uh, your, you know, kind of spend that you make, where you reside, what is your, you know, overall profile, 
you know so without any restriction as of now these organizations or these you know social media apps i would say they are they are you know conducting these kind of uh, definitely they would be having there are these are big names and they would be having you know adequate controls checks and balances but to prevent and to you know provide a redressal to a consumer like us you know let's say a data principal uh as of now there was no act and this act is going to you know help data principals to withdraw the consent and also to safeguard their uh, personal data if they want to because the obligation is on the data fiduciary to erase the data if uh, anybody approaches them uh, with a, with this request so one is this category which is sds and you know as i've said you know there are certain parameters like you know volume sensitivity if there is any you know uh, risk We never lost you again. Okay, looks like uh, Vinay is facing some uh, very bad internet, uh, Dave. Uh, so just to uh, you know, uh, just to continue, maybe Vinay, uh, uh, Vinay, if you're back, am I am I audible now? Yes, you are audible now. I'm not sure what's the. I'm sorry about that. So. Uh, uh, I mean, I would say, uh, you know, the the parameters which have been defined in the, I think, section 10 of the Act are the ones which will define, you know, what the significant data fiduciaries are. And to my mind, you know, we should those significant data fiduciaries should not wait for the Act to get implemented and, you know, rules to follow and all that. It, they should start looking into their own records and the, uh, uh, you know, the IT framework, etc., and start reviewing it in the light of the new Act. So, so when I have a follow-up question on this, maybe. Uh... You know, uh, would you call an, an NBFC of data fiduciary a significant data fiduciary? A bank, well, NBFC, uh, insurance company. See, in my view, I think uh, they would perhaps they would definitely be part of uh, significant data fiduciary because a lot of uh, information pertaining to see because if you talk about and uh, uh, talk about a bank, okay uh all of us we have bank accounts somewhere or the other you know we would have taken some personal loan or let's say you know a car loan or a housing loan etc or you know if somebody has not taken they are going to perhaps take some time in future so it's it's a it's a whole host of data that flows into the system of uh, uh, the banks who process the data and basis the uh, data processing they create a profile also and you know the uh, uh, risks, etc., also get associated with it, and you know there there is a proper file that gets maintained. So once the uh, loan gets you know over, once it is repaid, what happens to your data? What happens to your data is also something very important. You know, we, so so I mean they they have whole host of data. I would say you know in the banking industries because somewhere or the other we are all connected. We have Aadhaar cards, PAN cards, you know uh, perhaps credit card being issued by so by those banks. So those are all maintained with them. So they are definitely, I would think, uh, would form part of significant data fiduciary. Because see, the act does not specify, uh, you know, as to who all would be there. It says the volume and the sensitivity. So ba bank obviously, you know, churns out volume of uh, uh, data and definitely this data is sensitive. So I don't think there is any escape uh, for, you know, organizations like, you know, NBFCs or banks or even insurance companies to sort of, uh, uh, you know, categorize, be categorized under only data fiduciary segment. OK, and uh, you know, you also mentioned about the data protection officer. So what, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned maybe a data fiduciary uh, is not mandated to have a data a data protection officer as per the law. Should they, uh, uh, are you saying they are not mandated or you saying as of now it is not uh, uh, it's not uh, mentioned anything about them. See, uh, we have to wait for the rules also, uh, uh, Jen. Once those uh, are floated and those are, you know, uh, you know, uh, notified, I think it will provide a better clarity. But uh, the way it is mentioned under, you know, uh, the section of significant data fiduciary, not just the data protection officer, but about the audits also. Uh, that category categorically mention does not mention you know uh, uh, is is not mentioned for the uh, data fiduciary as such. But at the same time, uh, it is also mentioned that somebody has to be named as a data protection officer within the let's say in the consent form or uh, you know in 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 on the website uh, in the privacy policy perhaps 
so uh, to my mind i think uh, it is uh, prudent as of now uh, because every organization uh, somewhere or the other either through by itself or through data processor uh, they collect personal data because at the end of the day we are dealing with people and people when you appoint somebody you take you know information about their background their you know aadhar pan residence mobile personal mail id etc etc so every organization does that so you know therefore i would i would rather presume or would take a conservative view here that uh, you know we should have a data protection officer across uh, you know all organizations okay Nina, what do you want to talk on this? So, uh, I would say that there is no such bifurcation uh, as sensitive personal data has already said that it's a personal data which is uh, which the current or uh, the new law talks about. Uh, the current law has a bifurcation. The SPDI rules provides for the sensitive personal data uh, and the personal data. but i believe that in the the rules that will be notified by the central government there will be some you know bifurcation with this this respect because currently also this is covered in the rules so that's my sense is some bifurcation may come in future but currently it's the personal data and accordingly all precautions measures need to be taken with respect to the personal data business data is definitely outside the scope because personal data means the data that relates to an individual that helps in identifying an individual business data is completely different so that's my view so so nira what you are saying is uh, uh my name and my mobile number that's also personal data right, right. You, you know in the beginning also you mentioned about you know what you mentioned about some exemption there about uh, any name and mobile number yeah. getting stored in a in a database format by any company that becomes a personal data and one has to be careful about it Yes, 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 yes. So, in fact, on this point, uh, you know, this is my experience. I also want to add something. In GDPR, uh, since uh, as of today there is no data protection bill in uh, act in India, so everybody has started, uh, you know, uh, following the GDPR regulation because if you are having a, a mobile apps or or if you have any um, uh, applications which which storing or using data, so there. it talks about sensitive person information it talks about personal information uh, you know those bifurcations are very clearly given and some relaxations are given but as of today in the uh, uh, did uh, you know dbdb act in india it is it only talks about personal data so now if it talks about only the personal data uh, the way i am looking at in if you are you know specifically for my uh, uh, for my friends and i you know dealing in it now we may have to re architecture of applications we may have to re uh, you know uh, look at the way we are storing this information because being complying with the gdpr we can study bifurcating those data you know maybe what in which uh, you know table what kind of a data would get stored uh, uh, when i'm you know taking more than a name and an email like official email id of a user or mobile number of a user where it gets stored but today right now the way it is uh, uh, defined in uh, dptp i think and if if uh, rules are not uh, clear on this we may have to relook at our application we will have to re architect them uh, to get compliant with uh, uh, with this regulation okay yes okay jain do you want me to take this slide yes you are uh, okay thanks so uh, data fiduciary i would like to first you know give a slight emphasis or a background of the uh, definition of data fiduciary it refers to a person who determines the purpose and means of processing of personal data person means anyone it may be an individual it may be a uh, llp it may be a partnership firm it may be a group of individuals organized under any particular form so uh, as far as someone is collecting any information personal information and determines the purpose and means of processing that information because processing the term processing means everything it includes collecting storage transfer even viewing because it's a very uh, broad definition so uh, if i go by the obligation now obligation of data fiduciary first and foremost thing is that person has to take has to ensure the lawful processing of the personal information and that too in accordance with the law second they are they are required to obtain the consent except in case of legitimate uses where 
the deemed consent may come into picture. And for obtaining consent, they need to give a notice where they again the template or the format of notice is defined. The ingredient of consent is also completely covered in the act. So all those things need to be uh, mindful of at the time of obtaining the consent and giving notice for obtaining the consent. Then there is a requirement, then obligation of the data fiduciary to obtain the consent of the guardians when they are processing the data, personal data of the children. Uh, on the security side, they need to ensure that uh, technical and operational measures are in place to ensure the compliance with the uh, all the provisions of the law. When we say technical measures, generally, uh, you know, for uh, for the company who are processing, say, for for example, processing the payments by card, they are required to comply with PCI DSS regulations. These are the technical standards that need to be followed by the organization. Similar type of standards may be there for different industries. So need to ensure that all those standards are maintained. Reasonable security safeguards to be in place. This is again there in the current law. And this is the only thing which is mentioned in the current law with respect to what is required to be uh, done by an uh, organization who are dealing with the sensitive personal information. And they have given the name of ISO as uh, ISO standards as uh, you know major if you have if you are ISO certified it will be assumed that you have reasonable security safeguards in place. So uh, this is what they have retained in the new law also. Though uh, it's not specifically mentioned that ISO will satisfy the requirement of reasonable security safeguard but yes the it's an obligation of the fiduciary to have reasonable security safeguards in place. Then uh, it's important to have a data protection officer in case of significant data fiduciary other for other data fiduciary uh, for data fiduciary it's not necessary to have data protection officer but they need to assign someone who will be responsible for replying the queries of data principle or addressing their concerns on behalf of data fiduciary so they need to uh, appoint some spoc to deal with the request of the data principles and in case there is a breach breach means the breach accidental disclosure of any information personal information or hacking or something in that case they are in the obligation to notify the concerned data principles as well as the data protection board. Apart from this, they are required to maintain or set up a grievance reducing mechanism. So grievance reducing mechanism, again, someone is required to be allocated, though it's not clearly very well defined. It may come up in the rules, but why, what I understand, it's very common in all the organizations under current law also need to assign someone who will take care of all the grievances that uh, organization may receive from the data principle. Last but not the least, unless there is something else written under uh, law, they are required to erase the data on the request on the withdrawal of consent by the data principal. Here it's important because I have heard that, uh, you know, I have heard various queries where it is mentioned where they are asking that, is it mandatory to delete the data if the data principal requests for the deletion of data and processing is not required going forward? So here there is a caveat, there is a condition unless and until required under specific law. If it is required and as I specifically in most of the cases, there is a requirement to retain the information like for employee. We are under employee labor laws. We need to retain certain information of the employees to meet the uh, compliance requirement of PF, ESI or other compliance requirements. Similarly, for banking sector, they are required to maintain the data for say 10 years as per the RBI guidelines. So where there is a requirement to maintain or retain the data for a certain period of time, they are they can uh, they can uh, they can retain the information even after withdrawing of consent, but they cannot process the information. So these are the obligations of data fiduciary. Happy to take any question. So uh, uh, Nina, what uh, what I understand is uh, uh, you know in a more laymanish language is when I when I have other applications running in my organization where employee information is getting stored or maybe my as you mentioned about uh, the RBI guidelines maybe my uh, if I'm an NBFC or a bank uh, my customer information is stored if somebody comes and requests that I my data should be deleted I have to not just look at the you know just I just don't have to look at the data production uh, DPDB act and immediately go and delete the information I also have to be mindful of the other laws under which maybe there is a mandate of storing that information for a certain period of time. Am I right? Right, right, right. Now, now uh, here uh, another very interesting aspect here. Uh, maybe Vinay, if you can also uh, you know uh, comment on this. One, uh, uh, you know, some 
let's say I'm an employee for a company and the company would take my Aadhaar card, my bank card, my home address, my parent details. You know, my, they will have, they will give me a, a, a car policy and they give me an insurance and give me so many things that possibly anything and everything a company would have. Now, as per the law, uh, maybe a, 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 you know, a, as per labor laws, is everything mended? Maybe not. Now, can I then request to my company is after leaving the organization that, okay, you retain whatever is mandatory in the law, but delete rest of the information and they will have to oblige. So, uh, Jayant, I think uh, that is absolutely, uh, you know, possible uh, and an employee can always, you know, reach out to the organization requesting to erase the data once uh, he or she has left the organization. Now it is on to the organization to also assess, you know, what is it that, you know, that is mandatory or given under any of the law uh, that, you know, for that particular period that needs to, uh, you know, the data needs to be uh, retained. So, uh, for example, you know, the banking transactions that have happened with the employee, uh, obviously that is not going to go anywhere. That has to be, that has to reside with the organization only because that has during the course of the employment. Uh, you know, the, uh, for example, the Aadhaar card or the PAN card, etc. So there could be a limit that could be asserting uh, up to which, you know, those data can be retained. Uh, it is not that it becomes the, uh, you know, unconditional right of an employee to, you know, get the data, entire data erased. Organization also has to see what is the time frame that needs to be retained uh, by the organization. So another example, if I can give you is that with respect to, let's say, you know, the uh, health checkup data, right? So that data perhaps may not be so relevant once the employee has left and let's say three, four years have gone, you know, down the line. So that may not be relevant to the organization. So if somebody comes after a certain period of time and says that I need the, you know, data that to be removed, uh, those, those, those things can be, you know, finalized. So therefore it is also important for the organizations to also you know, look at and revisit their staff rules and policies, uh, uh, you know, employee handbook and accordingly see as to what is it that needs to, that is that is that needs to be retained uh, and, and, you know, for how long maybe a record retention policy needs to be carved out, needs to be, you know, implemented and uh, accordingly, you know, uh, these things, although employers are exempt in the in the in the act, but not not entirely as such, you know. So what 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 I'm again uh, trying to you know what I'm understanding is maybe after uh, my uh, you know record retention policy has uh, been framed, I may have to go back and rework on uh, some of my application pages also because sometimes what happened in the 90s, uh, we create uh, you know one single screen or one single form to get all the information maybe you know but some of them may be uh, required for uh, but if it had you have to delete it. It may not be possible, or the you know the uh, application may not have not have options to delete just part of it because you may make everything mandatory. Mandate. So uh, some information, sometimes uh, you know which is which can be deleted out of a period, as you mentioned mentioned, may have to reside in a different form, wherein the option to be given to delete that particular information while retaining the rest of it. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so Jane, complete the... categorization, recategorization of, you know, our database will be required. We are, we, we need to, you know, uh, bifurcate what is required to be retained even in all the circumstances and what can be deleted. So this, uh, once this is notified this and the rules may come in play, in that case, uh, again, cannot be done manually. Some technical uh, solution will be required to bifurcate and create a, you know, structure where this will be done automatically instead of manual intervention, because again, it will be very difficult. A person is going, then we will be deleting part of the information and retaining part. And then uh, there are different laws and the different laws, they are different time period mentioned for retention of the uh, information. So again, keeping everything in mind, we have to create a solution or technical solution may, uh, may be required to deal with this scenario. Absolutely. I think IT plays a very key role here. Uh, IT has to sort of, you know, uh, it is, the act is actually, you know, has to be owned up by, uh, I would say all the control functions, be it admin, be it HR, legal and compliance and technology. Okay, so uh, ingredients of consent. So, uh, 
this is basically you know one of the i would say you know the fundamentals or the you know the fundamental st stepping stone stones of the data protection act you know everywhere across the world and you know gdpr and you know our uh, dpdp act you know they they have they have been designed in different form shape manner but eventually the intent of the consent is to ensure that you know the person who is giving the personal data who is parting with his personal data be it sensitive be it uh, uh, you know other personal data is well protected and there is a proper mechanism to see that there is no data leakage and it should not be misutilized or should not be you know uh, leaked out to some other you know uh, uh, agencies without their approval so consent form there is no consent form that has been uh, proposed by uh, in, in the dpdp uh, uh, act but the key ingredients of the consent form has been uh, you know listed down very clearly in the act which is uh, uh, first of all to definitely you know it is it is uh, we all know that you know the notice has to be given first before before obtaining any uh, data the purpose so it is very important you know important to see that you know the date the, the the nature of the data and the purpose has to be defined very clearly it should not be a case where for example you know uh, you know i download a telemedicine app and uh, uh, to order medicines okay i understand my mobile phone number is important my residence address is important perhaps my email id is also important let's say so i have given these data but asking for the contact access to the contact list okay that is something which is uh, uh, not permissible under the act nowadays when you know we, we have seen that when we download certain apps they are they ask you to you know allow access to your contact list allow access to your phone media etc so the data fiduciaries have to be very very mindful while they are designing the app and now they have to redesign the app to ensure that what is what is required need to be asked and what is the purpose has also to be communicated to the data principal that's point number one point number two is uh, you need to sort of uh, you know also understand that uh, uh, you know it should be in a different language i mean the the act provides that there should be some languages uh, uh, as as provided in the you know constitution that those you know options should be given in those uh, uh, languages so somebody is comfortable with marathi or gujarati that option has to be given as part of the consent form it should be plain uh, in in a plain language easy to understand uh, the manner in which data principal can exercise uh, her rights should also be you know kind of uh, uh, be made part of the consent form mode of filing a complaint so let's say if a data principal would like to file a complaint against uh, a misuse of a data then uh, uh, you know how that person can actually do uh, uh, follow the grievance redressal uh, mechanism and you know how he should where he should reach, uh, reach out should also be laid out then definitely the contact details of the data protection officer which is also uh, you know kind of mandatory in the consent form so as such there is no sort of you know guided form that has been prescribed but yes there are key ingredients which have been mentioned in the act that needs to be you know designed and uh, formed and uh, adopted by the organizations Concert managers, we have already, uh, you know, discussed. Uh, I think in the interest of time, we can perhaps uh, skip that. Jant, over to you. So, um, Vinay, uh, you mentioned we are talk about uh, language. So, uh, and uh, as with the constitution, so you are saying he, uh, there are uh, there are so many languages in India which are which are there. You know, Marathi, Gujarati, Punjabi. They are all modified languages. So, my consent form should be, uh, you know, in all the languages. Or it can be well, only in English. Uh, see, uh, uh, you have to provide an option to the you know data principal, and the languages which are mentioned in the eighth schedule of the constitution, there are about twenty-two, twenty-three languages which are there. I think twenty-two. Uh, so this is again something that is you know part of the consent form that needs to be incorporated because if somebody doesn't is is not able to read Hindi or English, for example, he only knows his. uh you know language let's say marathi for example so one has to provide that translation otherwise how will the person come to know that what is he sharing and what is the purpose of you know uh, that data eventually be utilized who is the data protection officer what are my rights etc so the law has clearly laid out you know for for the protection of the data uh, of a data principal these this language has to be kind of uh, flexibility has to be given to the uh, data principal 
Okay. Uh, Neera, on the consent manager, would you want to throw some more light? Yeah, Jain. So I think this is a very interesting concept of consent manager because consent manager is the one who will be acting on behalf of data principles. It's not there in GDPR and I haven't heard it in other laws, but yes, in some uh, banking law or something, a similar concept is there. So uh, what will happen in this case, the consent manager will be uh, the person which will be registered with the data protection board and will be managing, reviewing and verifying the consent on behalf of data principles. Say, for example, uh, data principal would like to withdraw the consent from one particular service provider or uh, then there is an option for the cons uh, data principal to directly request for the withdrawal of the consent to that service provider or to the consent manager. Now take an example uh, that if a person has registered himself on 1000 plus apps. And uh, if a person has to go to the 1000 service providers to withdraw the consent, it will be very tough for him. And nowadays we definitely use numerous apps and where we share the data. We don't even care for that sharing of their data. Now the role of the consent manager is through the API. They will be collect. We'll be providing the uh, will be registering with the consent manager and they will be uh, connecting with the service providers. Service providers means a data fiduciary and will be managing our consent on our behalf. If we have selected that this is this, this, I'm just giving an example and uh, you know it's uh, my opinion because there is nothing in the law as such, but the concept is different and the research which I have done basis that I can share that they can uh, you know uh, request the consent manager and mention that the consent to be withdrawn from all these apps and then the consent manager will get it done from the various service providers. So obviously the, uh, the interaction between the consent manager and the data fiduciary will be through some API or technical solutions. I think this will be an interesting concept to uh, watch out for because uh, this would uh, bring another uh, layer in between the uh, data principle and the data fiduciary. Um, uh, and uh, how it exactly will work, I think uh, we'll have to watch out for. Thank you. OK. OK, uh, the rights and duties of data principle. Uh, obviously, uh, the rights data principle has the right to access the information of his or her information with the data fiduciary. They can get the data corrected, completed, updated. They can request for the erasure of personal data. They have the right to for grievance redressal, right to nominate. So these are the rights which are very general in nature, and I don't think uh, you know uh, uh, much detail is required. As far as the duties are concerned, very important because this time, in case there is a breach of duty, they have imposed a penalty up to ten thousand rupees on uh, data principal as well. So the first one is not to suppress any material information while providing personal data for any document unique identifier, proof of identity or proof of address. So uh, they are they are required not to suppress any material information first. Second, they are also required to comply with the provisions of the act. Uh, not to register any false or frivolous complaint with the board. Data protection board and furnish only such information which is verifiably authentic, not to impersonate another person while providing his her personal data. I just want to highlight one thing on the rights that they have the right of grievance redressal. So it is mentioned in the act that before going to the board, before raising any complaint to the board, they need to exhaust this remedy available, this right available to them. Means they need to contact the data fiduciary first, need to try to get the grievance redressed. If they are unsatisfied, not satisfied with the uh, action taken by the data fiduciary, they can reach out to the board. So that's all about data rights and duties of data principle. So maybe uh, you know if I'm relating it with uh, if I I'm dealing with any bank or a financial institution, I I have any problem, I first complain to them, and if otherwise I have an RBI ambushment, ambushment where I can raise uh, or uh, my concern or I can escalate my concern, I would say. So it, it will be something in the similar lines uh, what I understand uh, for the data producers, uh, fiduciary as well, all right? Yes, so they need to first raise it to the data fiduciary and then to do the board. Yeah. And uh, uh, Nira, you also mentioned about right to nominate. Uh, so, uh, any you want to say yeah. some more? So, uh, yeah, in, so uh, data 
data principal has a right to nominate someone in case of incapacity or inability because the to to manage their personal data with the data fiduciary. Say, for example, there is an accident happened to someone and they have they have the right to nominate someone who on its behalf can ask for the information, can update the information. Uh, just an example here, say someone is in the hospital and uh, their personal information need to be accessed. Now the person, the pers uh, the data principal is obviously cannot do so because of the inability or incapacity. In that case, this nominee can help in getting that information for that person and can, you know, get it processed. So this is uh, important right in the hands of data principal. It's not necessary that data principal himself has to take all the actions. He can nominate someone to take action on his behalf. Yeah. Okay, so uh, there is an important part of the consent which says that for collecting personal data, one has to take a consent, specific consent, and that should be, uh, and the ingredients has already been shared by Vinay. Now, there are certain scenarios where consent is not required, and they have termed it as a legitimate uses, where the consent from the data principle will not be required, but that's limited to the consent only, all other or rest of the act will be applicable on these scenarios as well. As far as the processing is concerned, all other uh, provisions will be applicable. Now, where they can uh, avoid the consent is one first, for where there is a specified purpose and voluntary sharing of data happened by the data principle. Uh, where for the purpose, uh, the data has been shared with the government authority for obtaining some benefit, services, license, permits or for fulfilling any, fulfilling any obligation under any law in the interest of sovereignty, integrity of India, security of the state, some information has been shared with the government of India that can be, u that can be used without the consent. In case of medical emergency involving threat to life of data principle, I just gave you an example that there is, there is an accident and person is uh, under medical emergency and this hospital is completely new and does not have any information back uh, other records. In that case, the information from different hospital or the, you know, uh, the center where the medical record exists can be sought and can be used. And for this, again, the consent will not be required. For compliance with any judgment or decree, uh, taking any measure to safeguard or provide assistance during disaster or breakdown of public order, and for employment purpose. This is the most important, I believe, employment purpose because uh, on the previous current law, there is no such provision and there was lots of confusion. Uh, I have seen that organizations are taking consent from the employees for processing their personal information. See if, just imagine if employees refuse to provide the personal information uh, consent, what will happen? Will you not process the salary? Will you not transfer the PF? But at times, uh, because of the confusion, they still ask for the consent. Now they have given the clarity for employment purpose. No consent is required. So that's all the legitimate uses. So uh, significant data fiduciary, which we have discussed uh, earlier as well. So uh, section 10 of the act prescribes uh, that, you know, the center government can uh, call out, you know, depending upon the parameters which are mentioned, uh, signify or, you know, denote such uh, data fiduciaries as significant data fiduciaries. And these are few of the examples or of the parameters which are mentioned there. So first of all is the security of the state and public order, which means that, you know, if there is any organization which is dealing into the data, which has, which could be a, a you know, if it leaks out, it could be a, a threat to the security of the state or to the public order. That definitely, even if it is not, uh, you know, uh, uh, churning the data in a voluminous manner, but the data is sensitive. So therefore, that could be termed as significant data fiduciary. Right to the risk, uh, risk to the rights of the data principle. So if there is any organization, so if there, if if you know the government thinks that you know the data has a risk to the, uh, you know, rights of the data, data principle, then also I mean that is also one of the parameters to assess. Definitely volume and sensitivity, uh, as I mentioned, you know, at the beginning, the social media apps, which have the volume and also depending upon the sensitivity, because there are a lot of data of children that gets, you know, uh, uh, collected by social media apps, because 
people at the age of you know 12 13 you know we see we see that you know they they enroll themselves into various social media apps provide their location maybe provide their email ids their phone numbers etc <clears throat> so that category also would be part of uh, sdf potential impact on the separate sovereignty and integrity of india so this is obviously i would say uh, I equivalent to point number one uh, security of the state and uh, risk to electoral uh, democracy that is something which is also you know part of uh, uh the you know sdf category uh Jent? yeah we go. okay a follow-up uh, discussion on the significant data fiduciary what are the key obligations that it has to comply one is the appointment of a data protection officer it is mandatory for all the sdfs to appoint one and uh, data protection officer has to be uh, reside has to reside within india uh, it cannot be a person who is, uh, you know, located outside the country. Uh, the other uh, aspect is to uh, have a data protection impact assessment. So this is uh, in addition to the audit, independent audit that, uh, you know, SDFs have to undertake. So this uh, assessment uh, would cover, you know, how the data has been processed, what has been the overall impact, is there any you know, uh, negative comments or anything of that sort, you know, that needs to be, that assessment will be, uh, uh, will be, will be made. What are the key systems and the controls the organization has? Similar to, I would say, or complementary to, I would say, an independent data auditor who is going to review the entire applicability of the act uh, by that date, by that say, uh, significant data fiduciary, whether, you know, all the uh, rules and regulations and, you know, the requirements of the act have been properly met with or not. There are, you know whether there are reasonable security protocols which have been instituted in the organization or not proper trainings etc sensitization to the key stakeholders have been done or not so these are the you know uh, uh, few uh, key pointers that you know perhaps the independent auditor is going to look into and definitely this audit has to be an independent audit and is to be on a periodic basis it cannot be that you know once it is done and we are through for next two years three years it has to be done although periodicity has not been defined in the act but I, I believe, and you know, perhaps you know, in the rules to come, this periodicity would also be called out, uh, so that you know the organizations are clear as to what and mandatorily, uh, you know, in what frequency they have to make the audit conducted. Plus, they have also mentioned that uh, you know, keeping the window open as to uh, how this act spans out uh, accordingly, the central government will sort of you know add, may add, you know, more uh, checks and balances to ensure that you know data leakage is prevented data is not misused especially from the significant data fiduciary perspective failure uh, may attract specific penalty up to rupees 150 cr which is uh, uh, you know this is in the range which was uh, in the earlier draft also which was there uh, so it is it is one of the very i would say you know uh, key points for those uh, who are into the organizations who are potentially be called out as a significant data fiduciary and as i mentioned that you know people uh, or the compliance it side or the uh, hr function should start thinking about how this is going to happen and i think there are enough cases uh, you know and and uh, uh, help that is available in the sense that you know how it is to be implemented you know there has to be a brainstorming session that needs to be conducted within the organization on how this should be uh, implemented <clears throat> But on the yeah. on the on the penalty side, while uh, from an Indian parlance side, uh, this sounds very huge. But I don't see any other laws which have the penalties up to 150 crore. But um, if I look at from the global standard, for, you know, and, uh, I think uh, this is still uh, still very very reasonable because GDPR talks about your global uh, you know uh, turnover and the percentage of that could be of you know could be fine. It doesn't define a limit per se. All right. Absolutely. Well, I agree. I agree with you. But uh, you know, looking at this kind of a penalty, also, uh, if you would notice in other acts and statutes, such penalty, high level of penalty, you know, is not uh, you know really called out uh, uh, in in so much detail. So right. here, just to grab the attention of the industry that look, this is how this act is serious, and you know, we need to look, you know, give a serious thought towards it because. Uh, uh, the the powers given to the board are of you know civil court uh, and and they can call out for you know by ser serving a summon calling out for an investigation they can do everything as I've mentioned that perhaps 
it is equivalent to you know a major regulator in the organization in, in the country so uh, one has to be and this is just 150 crore there is another clause where the penalty is 250 crore in the act so that is the maximum you know uh, uh, and it could you know be increased or followed or you know multiple breaches license would be you know cancelled and so on so in my view i think it is to bring more seriousness uh, and and if you uh, would have seen you know the schedule of penalty is very short and crisp easy to understand uh, and therefore very simple to kind of you know uh, it is not really a legal kind of a language which uh, general public cannot understand so uh where any and i want to take your opinion you know both your opinion uh independent audit uh, data auditor who could be the data auditor in this case you know like your you already have a statutory auditor you already have you know so gent it will be a third party only as it mentions independent so it cannot be anyone from the organization i believe it will be a third party equivalent to you know like we have for caro also for where it is applicable we have a cost accountant so accordingly it will be a separate auditor and maybe the report will become a part of the chat audit report so you never know your thoughts, uh, maybe, yeah. maybe give a couple of examples. So, uh, no, I agree with Nita because see, when you say an independent audit, uh, you know, so which means that, uh, for example, you know, uh, for a statutory auditor of an organization, they are not supposed to, you know, deal into other activities. They cannot take up other activities, right? So that is how the independence is ensured of the statutory auditors. So here also the independent audit would mean that there has to be an external agency who should have that uh, relevant document, relevant capability, capacity, etc. Understanding of the law, uh, both from the technical side, that is, you know, from the IT perspective, as well as from the legal and compliance perspective, uh, who should have a good background and overview of uh, how the data, uh, 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 the act has to be kind of implemented. So I, in my view, it has to be a separate organization only. Although it can be an existing internal audit, which is a separate organization, for example, generally, you know, organization engage uh, 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 internal auditors and third party, which is appointed by the audit committee and the board, they report directly to the audit committee and so on. So similar in that similar aspect, perhaps, you know, this uh, audit needs to be uh, conducted. Okay. Now, this is this is an interesting uh, uh, slide. Uh, because I'm sure everybody is waiting for this. How can I start preparing for, uh, you know, for this, this, these, uh, for these laws? And, and now I, uh, again, I, for the benefit of people who are uh, from the non-legal background, um, because this, this query has come to me from many people. You know, they said the president has signed. Now it has become act, uh, so it is applicable. Uh, you know, so just for the, for the benefit of those who don't, you know, don't come from the legal background. Uh, yes, it becomes an act, but it is not immediately applied to, or it is not immediately applicable. So, uh, so the government would come up with rules, uh, you know, which will be more specifically defining in many, many other uh, things in the act. And when you have to read that act, you will have to read those act along with those rules and regulations. So, yes, I think the countdown has begun, but it is, uh, it is not implemented or is not applicable from uh, from today onwards so we still have some time window in our hands to start preparing ourselves start understanding start putting the processes in place start looking at the investments whatever is required identifying the people uh, with whatever understanding is provided in that but we'll still have to wait for the regulations to come in hey mike am i and my understanding correct uh, yeah that is correct uh yes. because you see uh Right now, the board also has to be constituted. It is not that the board has been constituted by the government. So uh, I would presume that, you know, uh, like in the case of GDPR, uh, the time frame that was given to the industry to follow was about two years. Uh, I don't think that much period would be given by the government, considering the uh, act has already been sort of, you know, delayed so much. It's been into the discussion since last so many years. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, they would definitely, you know, uh, provide uh, some time frame to my mind. I, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe uh, a year or so where whereby all the organizations have to, you know, 
sort of uh, uh, come on come on board and you know start complying with the act uh, uh, but having said that uh, in my opinion uh, the data fiduciaries and significant data fiduciaries especially they should not wait for uh, uh, you know the act to actually get uh, uh, you know implemented uh, in the sense that uh, they should they should start working towards uh, you know uh, looking into their systems controls processes start having or you know make a committee out where the representation is being made from each of the functions let's say hr uh, legal and compliance uh, you know it admin you know and then you know start seeing it as to what are the documents that they are collecting how they are stored how they are you know preserved is there a possibility of data leakage etc i mean all those checks uh, one should start looking at it from now. Okay. So what I also understand, uh, and Nira, you'll have to add uh, uh, your thoughts here also. See, uh, unlike other laws, we are a GST Act or a PA for uh, other laws uh, where it's all about filing, filing, you know, what what filings we have to come on, compliance will come in there. I think this is more of a process uh, uh, which has to come in place. This is more of a discipline which has to come in place. This is more of an awareness uh, at every level. You know, uh, uh, you and at, at, in every function. When a GST came, yes, impacted the organization big time, but it was only the finance function which was impacted. Uh, you know, which had to get as a survey for the GST Act. But in case of uh, uh, DPDP Act, it's not just about the finance function. I think your HR. Uh, because they are collecting data, they are dealing with personal data. Uh, finance, uh, in many cases, you have vendors, you have you know uh, 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 you know personal data coming in many places. IT uh, obviously has to get it, will get impacted. Sales, marketing, operations, uh, depending on what you are doing in your business, uh, what kind of a business you have, I think every function gets impacted. And uh, bringing in sensitivity in or, or you know sensitizing of, of all those functions. Um, creating awareness among all those stakeholders in terms of dealing the data uh, and has to be, you know, uh, has to be there. You know, you can't uh, no longer can no longer just, you know, be very casual about how to take, take data, uh, how people are, you know, for, you know, collecting the data, storing it, managing it. Uh, I think those all things organizations have to start putting policies and process in place because any misuse at any level would possibly come back to the organization. Mira, correct mind. Yes, yes, and uh, just to add here that it's not about the department who are collecting. Each and every employee is in, you know, position of some personal information. As uh, example, say if so I am hiring in my team, I have number of, you know, uh, resumes which have personal information. So uh, we really need to see how, where it's getting stored, it's getting collected. And a self-assessment is definitely required as far as the personal data uh, processing in the organization is concerned. Uh, it will be, uh, you'll find that each and every department member involved in some way or the other. So definitely need to set a process to uh, first to determine that the, the, the standard process, how the flow will be, how the collection will be, how the storage, how the processing, everything will be. For, Internally, we have to think the set things, uh, set the things right, and then definitely uh, the external side. When we need to collect the personal information, we need to update the policies. We need to set a process there. At uh, we need to set up a mechanism how the consent can be withdrawn, how the personal data can be updated. All these things, I think it will be difficult for the organizations to do all or everything on her own. There may some expert, you know, uh, help will be required. But yes, this it's a high time to start working on this requirement. Sensitization of the employees is very important because it's not about intentional, even because of unawareness, there may be a slippage, there may be a uh, accidental disclosure. So all that may create a problem. So yes, internal as well as external, both needs to be taken care of. Yeah, so just realize we are almost uh, uh, 30 minutes late. Uh, so uh, uh, we are already at 524. Just to uh, you know, uh, conclude, uh, there are some questions which obviously users have sent to us, and I and uh, I'll quickly touch uh, touch on those questions also. Uh, 
an act requires the appointment of a data, independent data auditor who will take up his responsibility in an organization. I think this has been addressed. The act requires data producers to obtain consent for data already existing with, with, uh, with them for data principles. What sort of internal arrangements are required in this regard? Uh, if you could throw some light on this. Uh, the second bullet point, Jayant. Sorry, I missed yes, that. The second point, right? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so see, uh, you know, uh, internally, uh, the organization has to see as to what kind of consents. It is not that you know the organizations uh, who are dealing into personal data, they perhaps are not you know, seeking consent at all. Somewhere or the other, some, you know, the, the aware organizations or compliant, I would say, organizations, they are sort of seeking consent in some form or the other. So the process by which that consent is being sought, that needs to be looked into. And, you know, as I've said, it is not just the responsibility of one single department, like that is HR or somebody. It has to be, you know, a joint effort, at least initially for the at least two, two, or, three, two or three years, you know, till the time the uh, uh the the system gets stabilized etc so uh i would say as i you know also suggested a while back that there should be perhaps a committee that can be formed because the views of the hr spark it you know uh, the other functions have to be taken into consideration and then accordingly a consent form needs to be designed it has to be digital because uh, uh, i mean the data protection board uh, they are digital and they have used the words that they, it, it is going to be a digital office. So their expectation is also that everything has to be in a digitized manner. So uh, the key ingredients have to be incorporated. How, how it is to be, you know, sub, uh, uh, you know, obtained. That is something that needs to be designed. So depending upon the industry to industry, it will it will vary. So for for somebody who is not processing so much of personal data, for them it may not be a big deal. But yes, for the organizations who are processing huge data. Uh, you know where the apps are being circulated across employees or let's say you know across uh, uh, you know various uh, stakeholders or data principles there it has to be a smarter way to you know uh, uh, implement that maybe by a way of a pop-up or may, maybe by way of a yes or no or something like that that has to be kind of you know looked into so we're in, the, in the same way if you could uh, you know also look at the point number three you know specifically what is talk about uh, what happened uh, to the data from customers which whose accounts are closed by fintech on the FSI institutions. What what do they do with this? Uh, so it says is obligation of obtaining consent retrospective in nature. So the consent uh, again, you know, the act specifies that in case you already have the data, uh, personal data of individuals, then you still have to, you know, inform them if they want to withdraw it or if they want to change it, etc. And if let's say they are uh, they have to review you know what is the database that they have in terms of you know the customers which are old very old and you know historical so one has to take a decision and a call that whether these data has to be retained by us because as per the act you cannot retain the data forever of an individual if the purpose is met if the purpose is served except in the cases where you know it is required by the law to be retained other than that you should have some justification as to why you are keeping this data so one has to really look into, uh, you know, the these aspects and definitely uh, the knowledge acumen of the legal professionals uh, comes into the play as well as the IT has to tell uh, advice. For example, you were mentioning that, you know, I have a single form where all the data is being captured. How do I, you know, uh, 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 discard a particular segment of that, of that data? So then IT has to come into the picture because <clears throat> it has to be done some way or the other. It has to be defragmented and then needs to be, you know, discarded. So th these things, you know, depending upon the organization to organization have to be looked into. And definitely, you know, the global practices also would, you know, play a vital role here uh, as to what is being followed globally. Uh, that perhaps will give some flavor of how this act becomes applicable and, you know, how one, one, one can actually implement it. Uh, the next one. Uh, uh, will print media be required to comply with this act? Uh, and as newspapers are also available in digitized form via apps, website requiring readers to insert their email ID address. Uh, I would not uh, would ask anyone, but I would address it myself. Yes, as uh, you know, as normal, you are you're taking anyone's information, uh, personal information, identifiable information. Yes, you uh, you know you have 
to come, you know, you fall under this act, you will have to comply with the regulation. Nira, I, I want to want you to answer this uh, next question. I think this question is, you know, has directly come from someone's heart. How will the act regulate marketing communication and promotional message? <laughs> so, uh, uh, see, currently also they have the option to avoid such type of message. But as per uh, the new act, obviously the consent and specific consent will be required. If you allow, then only such messages will come to your inbox. If not, then obviously you'll not get such that you should not get such messages. Uh, will uh, yeah, but we have seen that uh, the uh, in current scenario there is a journal consent which they you know take from you that uh, which will not be the case in the new act. That should be the very very specific consent for the specific purpose. Like for the promotional masses, it will be very specific what information will be used like your email id will be used for the promotional message use you are giving a consent for uh, using your email id to for the promotional message if you don't then obviously you'll not get you should not get the messages so so what i've seen in you know many applications uh, where uh, they specifically call out that uh, i'm taking your uh, uh, subscribing due to my one two three four uh, newsletter or you know kind of communications so you want to withdraw out of one of them you could you know, withdraw, right? I think some something similar. Yes, so uh, there should be an option to expressly confirm for each and every requirement. It's not that they can take a bundled consent. Okay, so it cannot, you cannot write one statement and say, okay, fine, I've, I've taken a consent on it. Yes, 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 yes. That That's option true. then is gone completely, you know, by seeking a consent like I accept and, you know, everything under the sun gets, you know, accessed by the, uh, data fiduciary. That option is completely gone now. The person mm -hmm. has to, data fiduciary has to call out the nature of the data, the uh, type of data, uh, the purpose for which it is being used for. So, for you know, the example that I gave of a you know telemedicine app, they cannot unnecessarily take my contact list just because I'm buying some medicines from them. So, data fiduciaries have to really you know think through as to what they are asking and why they are asking and what should be the expiry date of that data. So, uh, you know, there's another follow up question on the same. Uh, can a uh, can a data principal give a specific consent? I think the you know this is what we are uh, you know what the act says. Um, for example, I am I am opening an account with a bank, and I don't want bank to call me for any uh, home loans or credit cards or insurance for purpose. I can the bank has to give me an option if I want to be called for these things, and if I don't, I would I can specifically opt out for for all of them. Uh, uh, correct me, Vinay and Nira, if my understanding is wrong, right? Yeah, that's yeah. correct. Completely. Absolutely. Okay, uh, so the consent manager, sorry, Vinay, you saying? Yeah, I'm saying, you know, the act is very, you know, crisp and it addresses, uh, uh, I would say, most of the questions and concerns of the industry. So uh, I think, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, implementing an act like this, you know, when we are becoming literally, uh, you know, we are uh, the second largest uh, uh, internet users in the world after China. So, uh, you know, for, for us, it is very important and the way it has been structured in such a short and script, uh, crisp manner, I think it is really commendable on the part of the government as well. Now, you know, the person who have to implement, you know, with, with, a, with the right intention uh, would be able to take out the ways and means how to implement it. Right. Great. Right. Uh, who will be the consent manager? Uh, I think uh, Nira, you, 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 you know, uh, spoke uh, in detail on the same. Uh, and the last one, what is the primary conflict of issues between RTI Act and the Data Protection Act, and which has the overriding effect in the case of the conflict, if any? Um, I would uh, refrain from answering this. Uh, this is this is something we've been getting discussed in the te you know television debates nowadays. Uh, I think we should follow the, those debates to get this answer. Uh, we would want to you know, uh, and I think uh, 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 but good good thing is government has in this uh, a new form of the act has included itself as also, which means uh, you know my data with government should also remain safe because uh, government is collecting our data on many occasions uh, and uh, you know all of our personal data is or any kind of a data is with government i think uh, uh, while uh, there could be many opinions on this uh, but uh, for sure uh, 
if it is applicable on government and government, uh, uh, you know, uh, government uh, authorities as well on government uh, entities as well. I think we as users as a, are uh, are more protected. You know, today if I a very common example, if I give, if I want to uh, take out a Aadhaar card or a PAN card of a, of a director in any company, it is it's very easy because it's available on the MC portal. You can just go and download it for giving hundred rupee, which is not a safe option for a director. You know, it could be a you know, it could be any uh, top shot in the in the, uh, you know in, in India who is running a large organization. Also, his PAN card and Aadhaar card can be available at hundred rupee, which is not a very safer option for him. So I think uh, this gives a lot of protection. Now, it, this can be interpreted by anyone, and you know whether you know RTI Act company should be there or not. I think uh, uh, that those are more political uh, debates. But uh, as an individual, I feel safe. Government uh, also is getting covered in this. Many of your thoughts? Absolutely. No, I completely echo uh, you know the thoughts that you have shared, Jen. Uh, and you know this is just the beginning. Uh, uh, I think uh, it is good that you know the industry is lapping up. There are no major criticism uh, against the uh, act which has uh, you know been floated now, and uh, uh, the rules will bring more clarity uh, and and would also provide you know the timelines, the uh, perhaps the forms, etc., uh, which perhaps we will be we are, we are uh, the industry is grappling with right now. Uh, and uh, uh, we have to see how you know uh, it, it it actually you know spans out frankly uh, but but again you know i keep on uh, repeating myself that uh, this is a conclusive act and we should uh, from the industry perspective we should lap it up and you know we should start implementing our you know processes etc because no major or substantial change or material change is going to take place it is i think uh, uh, in my view uh, frankly it is going Rules are going to complement only to the act. They are not going to, you know, overrule any 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 of the provisions. That's my understanding. Nira, any concluding remarks from your side? Yes, I completely agree what Vinay and you mentioned right just now that this act is really very crips, and there is no no major obstacles I can see. But rules will definitely help in ensuring the compliance under the laws, and that will be complementary to this act. So definitely, uh, but yes, it's a high time. Organization really have to work very hard to ensure the compliance. Government has done his job. Now it's up on us to ensure the compliance for the organizations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Meera, uh, for sparing your time uh, today or being a weekday. Uh, and I think we have already overshot our time with this problem with, the, <laughs> with us. I think the discussion goes on and it gets interesting. And in fact, uh, as we were talking, I was realizing that uh, you know this uh, this act does not require a webinar; it needs a workshop. There are so many questions which were flowing in, uh, practical from you know, uh, from a practical aspect. Um, it needs a very very detailed discussions, uh, and we may have to do uh, some follow up sessions as well. And we I think we, we would uh, as the rules uh, start uh, uh, coming up, um, we would uh, you know try and do that. And thank you so much, um, Vinay. I think your uh, inputs were quite in insightful uh, at this. Uh, uh, I'm sure a lot of uh, queries from the users have been addressed. But as we say, it's, uh, if this act is here to stay. Uh, this act is uh, in some form or other. Uh, it would come, you know, on a uh, very uh, offline discussion uh, while still yes. getting recorded and people are there. Um, Will this, survive, will this survive the next moment and uh, will 24 uh, will be there? And what my personal view is, India needs a data protection act. Whether you call it the DPDP or call or whatever you would call it, India needs a rate and it's high time India would get it. As an individual, uh, one who would feel more safe because today information, uh, the personal information is out everywhere. It can be easily bought, accessed. Uh, there is no control, but with that, uh, it coming in, I think it will weed away a lot of uh, those players who uh, do not pay attention to the process and uh, the data, the sensitivity of the, the individual data. Uh, but it would strengthen uh, the personal use and will make users feel more safe. Uh, because today it's not just about our individual data, our kids' data is also available. And the way AI is coming up and the way, you know, uh, 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 
uh, machine learnings are is happening i think so we need to uh, have more control on our own data we need to have uh, you know ensure that our data are you know we are more safe in the digital world uh, and as uh, things shape up uh, we we'll keep watching you know we we'll keep informing you we we'll keep uh, talking to you thank you everyone for uh, uh, for uh, attending the session today i hope uh, this will would add uh, some value to this as address some of the qu questions you will have um, and uh, if you still need more information uh, you uh, there are some uh, there are some articles written on our uh, portal we can go check that out as well and we would also be posting this uh, uh, recording this uh, this webinar on the uh, on our youtube channel you may can you can go and check that out also in a couple of days thank you so much everyone thank you nita thank you Vinay. thank you thank you jen and thank you everyone bye bye